Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and I am excited to introduce our talented guests. A celebrated director, playwright, screenwriter, and librettist, James Lapine earned three Tony Awards for Best Book of a Musical for Passion, Falsettos, and Into the Woods. His many other honors include the Pulitzer Prize in Drama, five Drama Desk Awards, a Peabody Award, and induction into the Theater Hall of Fame. He also directed the feature films Impromptu, Life with Mikey, and Earthly Possessions. Putting It Together is about Lapine's collaboration with Stephen Sunheim and many other theater artists to create Sunday in the Park with George, the iconic 1984 Broadway musical based on Georges Seurat's painting A Sunday Afternoon on the island of La Grande Chat. Tonight, Lapine will be in conversation with Benj Pasek, an Oscar, Grammy, Tony, and Golden Globe award-winning songwriter and New York Times bestselling author. Along with frequent collaborator, Justin Paul, he is best known for his work on Dear Evan Hansen, La La Land, and The Greatest Showman. The accompanying albums for each project have appeared in the top 10 of the Billboard 200, the latter of which is certifi certified platinum in over a dozen countries. He is on the board of the Dramatist Guild Foundation and the American LGBTQ Plus Museum. Benj, James, it's great to have you with us. The screen is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, hey, James, how you doing? I'm, I'm good, it's good to see you. Good to see you too. Uh, I, I am uh, glad to be repping virtually Philadelphia and uh, <laughs> have you here in virtually our, uh, our home city. Um, so I, I'm super excited to talk with you. When you reached out, I, I was very honored to be asked to talk with you because Sunday in the Park with George is obviously one of the most influential shows you know, to anyone who loves musical theater, anyone who's a creator um, of musicals, but I think even larger uh, than that, it's such an influential piece to anybody who just has like creative impulses in general and and like the book that you have written that captures the making of, I, I found to be so insightful as somebody who does this for my vocation, but also anybody who just like wants to go out and make a thing and to capture the essence of how a thing gets made. So, um, I, you know, personally, I have lots of very sort of dorky questions that I would dive into that might be too niche, but I guess I would just start by just asking like, how you, uh, who did not start off to, you know, necessarily write musicals and, and even be a playwright, how did you come to uh, becoming one of the sort of biggest librettist book writers, directors of musicals, you know, of your generation and, and, and kind of create this seminal work? How did it start? Uh, you know, it was, it was circumstance. It was kind of strange. Um, I, I didn't really was not a great student, uh, in high school anyway. Uh, I think I did one like school musical that my sister directed. My sister mm -hmm. was 10 years older than I and taught in my high school and she was an English teacher and they made the English teachers pass off directing the school show and she ended up directing one and asked me to be in it, you know, at which point I was a juggler. That's what I did. Um, but really didn't, um, we, we were born in Ohio and lived in kind of landlocked Ohio and then um, moved to suburban New York when I was a teenager. And my parents took me to a couple of shows, uh, but I didn't have any real interest in it. I liked music, uh, but I was a visual person, you know, I enjoyed um Actually, when I went to college nearby Franklin and Marshall College, which actually accepted me, which was pretty remarkable in and of itself, uh, I really actually became a very good student, enjoyed a lot of different things. I just like to do a lot of different things. I still do. Um, I enjoy just learning about things I don't know about and going to places I wouldn't normally go to. And I think my inherent curiosity somehow took me from being... Um, uh, a photographer was, the, was what I did when I got out of college. I studied photography, then I studied graphic design. I worked at the Architectural League of New York. I was a waiter uh, for many years in New York, which, you know, people say, how'd you learn how to write? And I say, well, I was a waiter because I love eavesdropping. I hate going to parties, but I enjoy being at a party when I don't have to talk to anybody and I can just listen to everybody else and eavesdrop. And I think I learned to write dialogue, oddly enough, 
from the various places I was a waiter, from the funky East Village don't to the fanciest. The, it, interesting, I somehow ended up with a cater, cater outfit in New York and the very first um, party that I was a waiter at was at the home of uh, Josh Logan, who was a mm -hmm. big, you know, director of uh, theater at the time. And uh, I guess once a month he had these kind of salons where all the composers uh, came over to his house and played the songs they were working on of musicals. And I just remember, you know, thinking this was just really cool that I was here at this event. Of course, I didn't know who anybody was. I, and for all I know, Sondheim was there, you know, playing right. it. Me, but anyway, so I, I just drifted into the theater um, through graphic design and getting a job at the Yale School of Drama. I hope that's your question. Yeah, no, I mean, from there, I mean, it, 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 it's such a, a jump to, you know, you, to get into theater and then to specifically get into musicals. I mean, your first experience with musicals was um, with Bill Finn. Can you talk right. about that, how that collaboration started and, and how, yeah, you, you began working in this particular genre? Yeah, I mean, um, I met Bill at Playwrights Horizons, which at the time was just this old porno house on 42nd Street. And uh, I did my first play that I wrote there and he did his first musical called In Trousers. And he saw the play that I did and he kind of tracked me down and said, um, you know, I want to work on a new musical. Uh, and I, I saw your play and you directed it so great. And Bill Finn has a large personality and I want you to direct it. And I said, well, I don't know. I mean, I've only like directed two plays and I don't know anything about musicals, but he said, no, you direct like a musical. So um, this was a time when Andre Bishop who ran the theater just said, okay, you've got two months, you can create a show upstairs in one month and we'll play it for one month. And Bill had like four songs. And um, we just went from there. And, uh, you know, I got a big pegboard and put a lot of index cards there. And I took the four songs and said, well, if they sing this and they sing that, then you need somebody else to sing something in between. It was like a whole puzzle for me. And, and you go, well, what are we gonna, what are they gonna sing about? And I said, well, let's see, you know, let's, let's add another character. We added the character of the boy in it. And um, it was pretty thrilling. And Bill sometimes would just come in with a song, but no lyrics. And he'd set the lyrics to, uh, you know, this little piggy went to market. <laughs> so I'm like directing, you know, this song that everybody's singing, this piggy went to market, this piggy went to da da. And, and, and I would make the story in the staging, you know, and, and then Bill would see what I was doing and going, oh, okay, so they're moving into a house here, so we'll do that. Yeah. Or, and it was so organic the way it came. Um, and again, it was built mostly on visuals. And is that, you know, is that, was that experience, did you kind of catch any kind of musical bug? Were you like, oh, I want to do this again? Or, what, you know, when, when you kind of went for the next, thing that you wanted to make, particularly with what this became? No, I, I, I still was just thinking this was going to be like being a waiter that <laughs> I'd write a few couple of little dinky plays, make a little money if I could, and something else would come along. Actually, I always wanted to direct a movie. That was my dream. Mm. So um, uh, one of the reasons I ended up directing in the first place when I was, uh, teach when I was teaching uh, graphic design at the Yale School of Drama was to work with actors to figure out what that's all about. So one day, if I wanted to direct a movie, um, you, uh, you know, Stanley Kubrick was a graphic designer, as was Bob Benton, two really successful filmmakers. So I thought, well, if they could make that transfer to filmmaking, you know, maybe one day I could as well. How did you then, you know, the, I mean, obviously you talk about it in the book, but how did you know for the audiences here who who have yet to read or will will be will be reading it soon? How did the initial impulse um, for this next project come about? And you know, you were looking for collaborators, you were looking for folks to create ostensibly another musical, right? And, and that's what led you to Santa. Yeah, I, I took a liking to um, Nathaniel West's A Cool Million, which is uh, a novella, uh, really, um, 
I thought, I don't know, I thought it could be a musical. And I was working with Stephen Graham, who was kind of my producer on the one play I did. And he said, well, who do you want to write the music? And I said, um, Randy Newman. So somehow we got to Randy Newman. I actually went to California and met with Randy Newman. And uh, Randy Newman said the material was too dark for him. <laughs> it's pretty funny if you know of any Randy Newman music. So then I uh, came back and through Stephen Graham, somehow Sondheim's name came up. Uh, and we, Stephen was close with a fairly well-known producer, Lewis Allen, who su uh, suggested him and called him. And it turned out that Sondheim had seen the two shows that I had done and said he'd like to meet me. And that's how we connected. And um, he read a cool, I met him. And then after I met him, he read a cool million and said, the storyline is too much like Candide, but you know, maybe we can find something else to do. So then, you know, you, you, you're pursuing of like, okay, I'm with Steven Sondheim, who at that time is a legend in the theater and you don't have nearly as much experience, but he's a fan of yours. You go over to his house, Ish, ish. You had seen what did you you I had seen? Fan, but he knew you, what you, had, you had seen Sweeney Todd, is that right? Or what you had seen? Yeah, Wonderful? yeah. I mean, my interest in the theater was really avant-garde theater. Mm -hmm. I mean, I lived down. I was, you know, I don't know what followed hippies, but that's what I was. You know, <laughs> I lived on Spring Street and Soho before Soho got hip, and right down from Robert Wilson's studio. And uh, I was into you know Meredith Monk, all the really avant-garde theater people, Richard Foreman. I was not an uptown kind of guy. So Sondheim, though I knew he was obviously a very well-known guy, I didn't really know his work so well. Did Was that something that you were concerned about because you were a downtown theater guy? Like, oh, this is gonna be, if, but to collaborate with someone who's too commercial or just you had respect for him and you thought, hey, why not? Yeah, I didn't really think much about it. I, I, <laughs> I didn't overthink anything in those days like I do now. I just went where the wind would be, you know. I thought, okay, I'll meet this guy, I'll meet that person, you know, we'll see what happens. And, and do, do and like the lack of, you know, you talk about it in the book too, but like the, the kind of not knowing, you know, the stature of the guy that you were going to go over to his house and say, hey, let's create a thing, like that kind of chutzpah. Do you think, you know, do you think that you would have had that, had you sort of had the kind of contextualization that you do now, or it's just sort of part of your personality? Just be yeah, sort of fearless in that it's, way. It's, part of my personality. I don't know why I'm that way, but um, I'm not easily intimidated. And um, I always think nothing is going to come of anything. <laughs> I have a nice negative attitude towards everything. So I go into something like that thinking, well, nothing will come of this, but let's see what, you know, I want to see where this guy lives. I'll see who this guy is, you know, and I have never been on the Upper East Side and, you know, a townhouse and uh, so for me, it was an adventure, you know, I didn't, I didn't go in there, you know, thinking this is my big break, maybe right. I'll get to the Broadway, you know, it was just, it was a Sunday and I thought I'll meet this guy, see what's going on, you know. So how did that then lead to what became of, you know, Sending the Park of George? In, in the book, you talk about different projects that you kind of discussed, you know, how, how did it lead to the, the it, photograph? It, and, yeah, and it wasn't, it wasn't very uh, attenuated. I think I came back, I'd only seen him, uh, you know, on weekends or whatever. And uh, I came and I, I, I mean, I was just, I was from another place, you know, and I think I brought like 10 or 15 images with me. And, you know, we smoked a joint and I put these images on on the floor and said, let's just talk about things, you know, and we look at this woman and, or that person or this famous photograph or whatever, and just kind of riff on it a little bit. And when I did uh, this Gertrude Stein thing, which was the first thing I ever did, which was a kind of a poem play, I did use um, the Seurat painting because it's just something that I was fascinated with. And that turned out to be the image I brought in that we both kind of could talk endlessly about. So it seemed, you know, that kind of, you know what it's like to collaborate. You really have to, you know, lock in with the other person you're with and be of one mind. You in particular who kind of you and your collaborator kind of do music and lyrics together, which I think is very unique, right? I don't know any, any. Yeah, you, 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 you kind of have to mind meld. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then exactly. like. Yeah. yeah, yeah, well said. So we mind melded. <laughs> 
and uh, he, he, you know, he liked the image, and um, I then just went off and I wrote five pages that just kind of stream of consciousness based on that painting. And uh, the one thing we said when we looked at that, after we kind of dissected the whole painting, uh, I finally said to him, you know, well, there's just one main character missing. And he said, who? And I said, the artist. And then I think he realized, oh, I got, I got it, you know? And that's where we kind of took off. When you talk about in the book uh, w with Sondheim, like one of the things that makes him so incredible is that he's thinking, I think this was in, in reference to the motifs and how he writes music, how he conceives a score, you know, yeah. in, in totality of the sound of the characters and all of that. But so much of the writing of, uh, of, of how you guys, you know, came about this really obviously wholly original story, um, you know, was sort of piece by piece, you know, the putting it together, obviously. So like when you have the idea of, oh, the person who's missing is the artist, what were then the subsequent moments where you discover, hey, this is what this thing is really about? You know, I, I think especially with um, things that don't, that aren't based on source material, and that's one of the sort of exquisite and, and amazing things about, about Sunday, is you know it's based on this painting, but so much is invented. And you know you talk about these certain moments that hit where you're like, oh, this solidified really the story that we're telling. I'm really interested from your perspective about what were those milestones. Obviously, you know, um, obviously finishing the hat, or you know, certain moments that really are like, oh, yeah. this is the story that we're writing, and and you know you're sort of finding well, it inch by inch. Yeah, I mean, it was very impro improvis improvisatory. I think the word is. Um, I didn't, I wrote the first five pages, but I had no outline or anything. I just sort of riffed, if you will, on right. the painting and the characters I chose to write about. And I do that a lot. The same was with Into the Woods. And I don't know where I'm going. And, and I think it's, it gives me a lot of freedom rather than worrying about where I'm going and what it adds up to. I like to kind of tap into my own unconscious, unconscious in a way and, and, and then find out, you know, a quarter of the way, the halfway through, step back, look what I did and try to then figure out where I'm gonna go with it. With Someday, it was somewhat easier because I knew off the bat, I was gonna do a tableau vivant of the painting. Mm -hmm. So in a way, that, that was kind of great to know what your act ender is. Um, so, but something like Into the Woods, I mean, you did know in the first act that everything was gonna end up happily ever after, but then of course the second act is completely wholly invented. So I, I, think it's, um, I think it's why a lot of people don't write original musicals because it's much easier when you're basing it on or having a, own, a roadmap of some kind. Exactly. And then two people can come together because they already have the common source material. When you're writing, you know, uh, purely from, from imagination with not knowing maybe who your characters were, but not what story you were going to tell, or you knew the story you wanted to tell, but didn't know the characters in your turn, you know, it becomes uh, more complicated. And I think the other thing is both with Bill Finn and Steve, I was very... Uh, spoiled because it was just the two of us, you know, but in musicals, it's often, uh, you know, you're writing music and lyrics and then you have a book writer and then you add a director and then you add a choreographer and it becomes rougher, I think, to have a single vision for something when you keep adding people into the creative process. How do you feel like, you know, in the book, you talk about the process of um, the first workshop and then eventually to to you know, off Broadway and and Broadway, H how do you maintain that um, that you know clear creative vision, especially when you're creating something original, when you know when you have an audience that you're using to shape the show. You know, one of the things that I find really tough is that you want to be very clear about what your vision is or the story that you want to tell, and at the same time, you are reliant on audience feedback. I heard a, a, a really great. Um, quote once that I think Lynn Aarons once said, which she said, you never trust one person's opinion, but you always trust a thousand people's. And I thought that was kind of an interesting thing of just reading an audience. Um, but, you know, when you're literally creating the thing as you're going, you know, and having to 
the, you know, the river is carving the rock, uh, you know, and, and the rock is, is shaping the river. Like, how do you trust that vision? Um, and also take into account that you're making it for an audience that that's being responsive every night. Yeah, I think that's the challenge. And um, you have to decide what you're making. You know, Seurat made this incredible painting that took two years, but was essentially rejected by his audience, you know, and, and same with the next painting and the next painting and the next painting. The guy never really sold a major painting, died at 31. I, I think it's, um, I think it depends what kind of work you're doing. If you're working in Broadway and there are millions of dollars at stake and you have producers and whatever, you have a responsibility to deliver a show that's going to be embraced by an audience eventually. Otherwise, you know, that's part of the contract that you're making. But if you're working at, you know, the 90 seat Playwrights Horizons, you do what you want to do and let the chips fall where they may. So I think it's a delicate, a delicate balance. Um, Did that pressure change for you though, when it became a Broadway show? I mean, you know, in the book you talk about, uh, you know, when is it in the New York Times or something, they talk about like this, how, you know, how it, all of a sudden this thing that was this very sort of private workshop became very right. much on the public stage. Well, that's um, page. you know, I, what I didn't take into account even though obviously I knew he was well known, I didn't realize the anticipation that went in to something he created at that time. Um, and that was not a pressure on me, that was more pressure on him, which is why he went off Broadway and, and found a different way to work. Um, you know, every, every project you do is individual, they're not all the same, you know, and one idea may be very commercial, one idea may be very personal that you, you have to do as a, as a person for your own satisfaction or your own emotional needs or whatever. And, you know, it's, no one likes to be criticized, but, you know, art is writ large with works, great works of art that were not recognized in their time. And um, I think you just have to make what you make. The minute you start letting an audience tell you what to make, uh, it's a different process. Um, as, as, a, as a young person or someone who was, you know, relatively new to the process when, you know, you talk about in, in, in this book, when audience members started to leave, did that give you pause when people would walk out in the middle of the show? Did, I mean, how did that sort of emotionally affect you <laughs> as, as you're creating this thing? It gave me more than pause. It yeah, I mean, you know. It almost gave me an ulcer. Is what it <laughs> Certainly. Um, well, it's hard to, to, to have that kind of rejection when I, I didn't know Broadway audiences and that's what was different for me. When we did it off Broadway, same when we did Passion, a workshop off Broadway, it was totally you know, um, engaging and, and embraced by the audience. But you know, when we did Sunday in the Park, Broadway didn't have the diversity of musicals that it has now for starters. And um, People uh, were often there going for uh, fundraisers and stuff, particularly in previews. They'd sell the whole house to, you know, people who were donating money to Mount Sinai and it was <laughs> Thursday night and they were exhausted from days at work and they didn't want to come see some, you know, bearded arty farty guy, you know, singing about painting, you know, it was just like, give us Bernadette Peters, you know, we're happy. <laughs> Don't give me ang the angst of making art. You didn't really relate to them. But you know, it took a while and we found our audience. And I think that that's another thing that is more of a producer's responsibility is to find an audience for a show. So I don't know, you know, I wish I had some wisdom to share, but um, I think you have to, there are two things you have to do. One is, I think if you're in this world, you have to be passionate about what you're doing, you know, feel, that I'm gonna spend a year, two years, three years doing something. And then there's this thing like, oh, I wanna live in a nicer apartment and I wanna, you know, I have to pay a mortgage and I got a kid to send to school or whatever. So I always chose to kind of make my living in film or, you know, whatever I could. I did some theater work for pay. And then I had this other little side that was just the things that my curiosity and, and passion followed. But it's funny, you know, one of the, one of the things that uh, Sondheim says, which I think initially you found hard to believe, is like, oh, if we if we wanted to write a commercial show, we would write a commercial <laughs> show, you know. 
<laughs> and, you know, he quickly kind of dispels that and says, like, that's not exactly how it works. And ironically, I mean, these things that I, I imagine you didn't necessarily think were going to be commercial end up being commercial. And is, is that, did that take you by surprise? Well, you know, come on. The guy, we couldn't be more different. I mean, he grew up, you know, on Central Park West and, you know, it's in, in, in a very high, went to incredible colleges and schools and uh, he came from a different world than I came from. And um, I think his first show was West Side Story. Hello, can we just say, you know, <laughs> he's living in a townhouse on the Upper East Side. It's a little easier for him to make that statement. Right. Because he can afford to, and not everyone can afford to. But the one thing he said that really struck me was when he said, you know, I think everything I do will be successful. And I, this is after he was coming off Merrily, which was a big flop and whatever. And I was shocked. I said, really? Why do you think that? And he said, well, I, I love what I'm doing and I love what it has to say. And I just assume other people will too. And mm -hmm. I think that in a way is the mindset. If you love it and, it, and it's what you want to make and it speaks to you, then you can you you have to take that satisfaction whether the public does or not which is very much you know what the show is about in a lot of ways yeah totally yeah like 40 years later you know looking back uh, like one what was the impetus to to write this book and two what did you kind of learn in the process of excavating um mm -hmm. sort of the past and you know what what came up for you in, in, in that process. Yeah, well, it's kind of two parallel things. One was um, I didn't have a book to read that helped me when I wanted to work in the theater. Um, I had, so thank you on behalf of all people who aspire to write musicals. Well, you know, it's a hard thing to teach, but I think it's easier to teach just by example of a situation than theoretical. You know, I read Harold Plurman's book and it was like, oh, if you pick the right theater and you do this and you do that, you know, that's how you become a good director. And this is what, what people don't teach you is that it's about um, working with other people and personalities and, and uh, dynamics and, and being a collaborator and having a partner and how do you navigate those waters. And then, um, you know, so I thought a book like this would be interesting for anybody in the, the wanting to go into the theater to see it from a different kind of perspective not so much how to as to well this is how i got through it and mm -hmm. you'll probably have to get through it in a different way but look out for this and that um and i guess personally i i didn't want to forget it i didn't want to forget the moment i didn't want to forget my youthful self and my brave self frankly you know, it's pretty, when you have nothing to lose, um, you know, you're, you're, you're daring, you're brave because you've got nothing to lose. But when you have a reputation and people like, you know, something you did 10, 20 years ago and you're feeling like I can't top that or nothing is as good or anything like that. So writing it from a completely different age perspective about this period was for me personally, um, really difficult and exciting. And um, uh, I tried to be as honest as possible and try to get other people to be as honest as possible talking about it. Because people think, oh, Sunday in the Park was such a breeze and it's so great and you won the Pulitzer Prize. And it's like, well, no, I lost, you know, 40 pounds. And I could, you know, my clothes were falling off me. I couldn't eat, you know, it was incredibly stressful. How did you make, you know, in the book, it's, it's really amazing because you, it's, there's a lot of honesty um, from the folks that you interview um, because you were a new director, because you didn't have as much experience with musicals. Folks really do speak very truthfully about, you know, when, when they sort of questioned what you were saying, when they learned to trust it. How did you sort of elicit that, um, elicit that kind of honesty in, in your interviewing for, uh, for you know, bringing that all up, like, did you sort of, how did you set that kind of tone? Um, in well, the, just very way? honestly, just saying you couldn't stand me to some people, or you know, <laughs> what was it about me that you couldn't stand, or what is it that made you behave this way or that way at the time? And there were people who said, "Oh, it's the most wonderful thing," and I loved every minute of it. I'm thinking to myself, "No, you didn't." <laughs> and and 
maybe you thought you did, or maybe you did, but we, from where I was sitting, I didn't feel supported, you know, mm -hmm. as a director or writer. But I think you must know this too. When you when you are starting out, people will actors are insecure, you know, and they're they need to be in feeling they're in the hands of someone who's very experienced and knowledgeable. And if you don't give that vibe off, um, you know, they're going to be uncomfortable and it'll be hard to get work out of them that you want because it takes a great deal of trust to make somebody go to a place they haven't gone before or a place they're not comfortable going and uh, places where they have to deal with, with who they are as people. You know, I always find interesting in musicals, I don't know if you find this, but I don't know, when somebody teaches a song, I rarely ever hear somebody say, oh, I don't like that lyric, you know, or I don't think that's a good rhyme, or can you change these notes, or the melody is mm, not so great. But you give them a play or a book of a musical, and it's like, wait a minute, why is uh, she yeah. that? Why is that happening? You no, know? we joke, we joke sometimes that um, songwriting is basically just like, uh, it's basically like delivering a, an exact line reading and no one questions it. Um, exactly, you know? yeah. yeah. Nobody does. And, and if then you would ever do that as a director or whatever, you know, you'd have actors up in arms, but it really, it, it's funny how it works. Yeah, and never question it. And um, I, when I rehearse a musical, I always make them do the song without the music and, mm. you know, work on the lyrics and take it out of the rhythm of the, of, of the score and really excavate the lyric writing um, so that it's, it's what I don't like about musicals when I go that people are not, filling a song because they're just letting because they have the music there it guides them and they don't they don't invest in it the way they would in, in a piece of dialogue where they have to create their own rhythm in a way so last couple questions before we start taking some audience questions um what now that you've done a ton of musicals what do you think makes something sing as opposed to something that should be a play how do you differentiate you know this should be a musical this should be a play this should be a movie that's a good, really good question. And that was very key to Sondheim working on this show because he kept saying, I think it's a play. You know, I can't write the music because it feels like a play to me, not a musical. I think, um, I, I think there isn't any, you know, prescription for that, but I think because somebody has to burst into song or slide into song or whatever, there has to be the material that requires inner thoughts, you know, uh, that can support an inner thought, which means that there's a dramatic, a, a dramatic dialogue going on between the character and the story and what they sing about. And then when people sing together, it's, it's about what brings those characters together to make them sing or doesn't, you know, so I, I, I don't know, you know, starting with March of the Falsettos, which had no book at all, as what one would call a book, but it did have a very um, strict structure and um, subtext that this, it heightened the music because of it. So I, I think, I think the hardest thing must be, and why I think I was successful in this regard was because I didn't have any frame of reference. You know, I didn't, I didn't grow up on musicals. I didn't grow up on theater that way that I had something like, oh, I got to write something like The Sound of Music or something, you know? But that also allows you, I think, to, to really challenge the form. You know, it's, 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 I think that the combination, this is just my assessment of like someone who doesn't know and then someone who's such a, Titan like a Sondheim coming together and that, that right. Venn diagram overlap of someone pushing and someone who really does know the form, that, that's where the newness and really amazing innovation can happen, you know? Because I, I don't think that someone who doesn't know anything can, can right. um, suddenly yeah. make a great musical, but I think it, it takes that, that freshness to then create something new. All right, my yeah. final- Yeah, no, and friction too. I mean, yeah. you need somebody to bounce off of and you know, Sondheim and I never had an argument, but we had intense conversations about things we didn't agree on. And we sort of had this silent thing, agreement that whoever cared most won, you know, <laughs> it would eventually get to a point where, you know, 
he would win a point or I would win a point. And you know, the nice thing about theater is if it doesn't work, you just go back, you, you try the other thing. So yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, no, I find that too. It's like whoever is the most passionate about the the moment, um, yeah. usually that that is the right direction to go in. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's ineffable. We're, we're working in an ineffable art form in a way. Uh, maybe it's another reason I wrote the book because at least it, it, I can be specific about certain things that people might be able to relate, relate to in their own work or approach their own work it might inform the way they approach their work. And, you know, it is a marriage and not every marriage has worked for me. You know, I've worked with people who I like and then I realize I don't like working with them maybe or people mm -hmm. I don't like, but I realize we work really well, you know, you just, you, you, uh, I guess are very lucky to have a writing partner in a way, which I think is, you know. Well, a lot of it, a lot of it is, yeah, for me, and, and I, I, you can tell in this book is about, is about uh, trust and, and having that kind of trust to be able to get into those sparring matches. It's like, you know, I, I think what you just said, whoever has the best idea, you and Sonheim never fought, but you're having creative arguments all the time to try to get at or arrive at the best no. idea. You can't have that without that sort of underlying foundation of respect and, and mutual admiration um, and trust that the other person really does want the best outcome for the piece. Yeah, you, you have to be egoless in a way. You know, when your ego is talking, you have to be very careful. Um, definitely, definitely. And ours was such an unequal partnership to start because I with little experience and him with so much, but in a way it was fantastic because I brought him to another kind of way of working and he brought me to a much more crafted way of working and something yeah. we met in the middle with the show. So I have some audience questions. So I am going to ask them to you now. Um, okay, this is from Anne Rosenspector who wants to know what were some of your ideas for Sunday in the Park that did not make it into the show? Oh, well, um, originally I wanted it to be a three-actor and I was gonna have the first act be the making of the painting, the second act was going to be the life of the painting up until the present, and then the third act was going to be the present and that would have spanned a hundred years. So as you can tell, it was a little ambitious. <laughs> and one of the paintings I wanted to do is the painting in the Barnes Museum which is called Les Pazuz, which has uh, the, he clearly was posing his model naked in front of the painting of Le Grand Jacques, which is probably in the studio. So um, I just thought, oh, there's just all these connections. The painting had a really interesting life. And uh, so there was actually a lot of things that I, that I thought would be interesting to do, but they fell by the wayside and we just made it the two actor. Um, this is from Jennifer Paxton. Uh, my father, who is a songwriter in quite a different genre, broke down in tears during finishing the hat because he felt as if someone really understood him. What was it like to work on a show that was so meta and that it was about the process of artistic creation, which you were, of course, engaged in throughout? Well, I, I don't think we were aware of it when we were doing it, to be perfectly honest, because we didn't set out necessarily to write that kind of show, we just got interested in this very bizarre painting that took two years and wanted to know about who was a guy that would spend two years making all these little dots on a canvas. And lo and behold, of course, it became about, you know, artistic passion and obsession. But it wasn't that we, I, I would say subconsciously we chose that and not consciously. And, mm -hmm. um, and then I, I liked the second act because I think it's, it's hard to follow yourself. It's hard to be an artist and be original nowadays. You know, I mean, it probably was always hard anyway, but particularly in this kind of disposable uh, universe we're living in where people are, communication is such that, you know, you're just turning over creation constantly. Um, uh, that was just an interesting book bookends for us. Um, but, you know, I think, I think what we did that was good is we didn't overthink it. We didn't say, we're going to do this. I mean, it's always interesting. You know, I was shocked when, well, the reviews, you know, were, were very mixed. Uh, but 
they all talked about Sondheim as being Seurat, you mm. know, and I, I don't know. I was shocked. I thought, wait a minute, I wrote this sucker, you know, and is it because he has a beard? You know, <laughs> it's like, I, I was so naive about it. I thought, well, now, of course, I, of course they're going to think that it's about him and it's about making art and all those things. But frankly, never was part of the conversation, never dawned on me that that's what people who were thinking critically about the show would immediately think, oh, you know, this is Stephen Sondheim and this is what he's thinking about. One of, uh, one of the quotes actually uh, that I, I pulled from the New York Times, which I just want to know what you think about is that it talks about Sunday in the Park is setting the stage for even more sustained theatrical innovations yet to come. Do you feel like, you know, are you aware of, and I feel as a, as a person who, who tries to make musicals, that Sunday really did change the game in a lot of ways. Do you, do you, do you feel a before and after, or, you know, because, because of the show? Are you aware of the before and after? Or, or? No. I mean, I was kind of shocked by it all because those kinds of things, because again, I came from, you know, my frame of reference was not Hello Dolly, you know, it was, right. uh, you know, Einstein on the beach. So, uh, you know, I, I was kind of um, amazed when people found it so different because it just, it, it, it just sprung from our imagination. It wasn't any intention to do anything different. It just organic. And, um, and I think when you're young, I think it was interesting between the two of us because I was so young, I was uh, and new to a form. I, I, I just saw things from a different perspective. And I think, you know, now I don't because I, I, now I know about all these millions of musicals and all these things and it's much harder to find, not so much that I'm fine trying to find an original thing, but trying to find something I'm passionate about and, mm. and, and an angle and a story to tell that speaks to me now. Uh, Toby Markham wants to know, would you tell us about the surprising contributions of some of the cast and crew? Thank you. Oh, um, well, they certainly contributed. Uh, it's been a long time, Toby. <laughs> Forgive <laughs> me if I don't remember a lot of specifics. Um, you know, there were things like, um, for instance, I wanted to have a vocoder, which changes your voice when Mandy sang the song about with the dogs. And Mandy says, I don't want a vocoder. I'll, uh, and he auditioned like four different dogs for us. <laughs> and we picked this dog and that dog. And he did a whole song with two different, you know, actors bring a lot to what they're doing. And Brent and Nancy Opal kind of created these, this German couple. I don't know how we landed on that. And um, uh, I think the actors in general, uh, those that maybe weren't getting the specificity of what they were doing off the page or for me as a director or Steve and I as writers, you know, they have to get out there and do something, you know, and at some point you just have to own what you're doing and, and make it your own. And um, by doing so, it brings more levels to the performances that are going on. Um, I'm sure there are examples, but at the moment I can't quite put my finger on it. Well, I'll say as someone who read the book, there are lots of great examples in the show. Oh, good. Uh, of, of, uh, in the book of where the actors have have brought elements of themselves, that, you know, and, yeah. and, and lots of cool, surprising things. So uh, a reason to to to, to read it uh, beyond just this conversation. Um, Carla Steen wants to know: Is there you were sort of speaking about this uh, finding what you're passionate about? Is there a dream project for a show that you, you haven't uh, figured out how to do yet, or that you haven't gotten the chance to yet tackle? Uh, well, there were some shows I did that that didn't work or didn't come together. I had always wanted to do a musical based on this book called Muscle by mm. uh, Sam Fussell is his name. I think he hey. made it in Pennsylvania, if I'm not. Well, there you go. And it rhymes, so. Yeah, well, there you go. Suspicious. Uh, and it was about a um, intellectual who becomes a bodybuilder. Mm. And I just love that idea of somebody who lives inside their brain and then suddenly creates this body that goes on top of it you know, armor almost. I mean, the bodybuilders look like they're creating this kind of impenetrable uh, armor. But then I discovered when we worked on it that people really, a lot of people don't like bodybuilders or looking at them or find them, you know, 
put them, puts them off. So, I mean, there, there are certain things. I mean, I'm working on two shows now and I'm excited about them. And, um, you know, you never judge where they're going to go, but they're about things that interest me. So. Um, and can you share any of that, that to the audience now? Well, one of them is, was actually, which is rare for me, was something that somebody brought to me, uh, which probably the audience here is much too young to remember or know about a thing in 1970 when Leonard Bernstein and his wife threw a party for the Black Panthers. Hmm. And uh, it was an article that Tom Wolfe wrote in New York Magazine. It was the entire magazine uh, called Radical Chic. And it was about Bernstein and those people who were uh, very elite and had a lot of money who were taking on these causes of radicals. And, um, and I... I um, thought it was interesting. I didn't know much about it. And then I knew I couldn't write it or write it alone. And I approached Anna DeVere Smith. And so we're working on it together. And that's just been wonderful. You know, it's like something I've never done with a writing partner who's not a composer or a lyricist and uh, writing with a black, uh, you know, a black writer and myself about white and black relations and uh, what's so weird and sad is that the 1970 issues are not that far afield from what we're still dealing with now. So it's been really wonderful. That's really exciting to, to a guy who, uh, one, of, uh, one of my formative experiences in high school was seeing a, a performance of Twilight Los Angeles. So I'm such a huge uh, fan of Anna uh, Smith. Yeah. Really, really cool. And Fires in the Mirror and very, oh, she's brilliant. very influential. Sunday in the Market George, Into the Woods, Fires in the Mirror, Twilight Sanders, that's, that's, that's really big for me. Um, okay, Jennifer uh, Huth, I think I hope I pronounced that correct. Two-part question from Mr. Lepine. You mentioned being a post-hippie downtown New York scene guy. Do you have any relationship or contact with other creatives of the NY scene of that era, such as Fran Leibowitz, Lou Reed, Velvet Underground? Did they have an impact on you? And with the cost of rent and living being so high now, is it possible for New York to harbor that many creative up and coming types again? Great question. Um, you know, though I, I was um, a fan of these people, I didn't know them, to be perfectly honest. I didn't really have any, I was just, I would go down to the Robert Wilson studio, which was just down the street from the loft I lived in. He'd have these kind of be-ins, you know, on Wednesday nights or something where you went, but I didn't really, even though that was the milieu that I was interested in, I didn't unfortunately have any interaction. The one person I did get to know was Lee Brewer and Mabu Mines. And I would say they were the people that uh, Lee and I both ended up, he was teaching at Yale and I was, there doing the graphic design and, and he and I became friendly and I thought he was terrific. Um, and I think the art scene is always there. It's just not in Manhattan. I think it's Brooklyn. It's, you know, uh, the other thing is now people can be anywhere. Um, but yeah, I definitely think the city is alive with a lot of creative people and they're a lot, they're in Philadelphia. They're everywhere, you know, there are pockets. And uh, it wasn't quite as, central downtown as it was when I was there, but I would say parts of Brooklyn are certainly similar to that. Um, Mary Frankel asks, please talk about how passion came to be a Broadway show. It has such a serious plot, something of an outlier for a musical. Yeah, Passion's maybe my favorite show I did with Steve. Um, that was his idea. He was fascinated by a movie called Passione de Mori, an Italian, um, film and um, it was about a grotesquely ugly woman in the 19th century who falls madly in love with a gorgeous soldier. She was the only woman on an outpost and she's a very sickly woman. And it's very simply about a story about love and how this incredibly handsome person, beautiful person falls in love with this extremely unattractive person. And um, Steve always wanted to do it. and. I didn't love the movie, but then I discovered it was based on a book and then we got the book in Italian and we had it translated. And then I, I saw how it could be done as a musical. You know, there, there's much more um, nuance in the book than in the movie. And uh, that one got written very fast and that just kind of poured out of both of us. 
And was the pathway to Broadway challenging because of the subject matter? Oh, yeah, I was a nightmare, you know. Um, <laughs> it was, if, if Sunday was bad, this was worse uh, because the show started with a naked couple in bed making love and um, the gorgeous Mar Marin Maisie and her gorgeous nakedness. And, you know, I could feel people all around me just, you know, just loving this vision and whatnot. And, you know, and then as the story progressed about the ugly woman, people were stirring. And by the time this whole idea of trying to make this handsome man fall in love with this unattractive woman was particularly hard for men to relate to, because it's really a show about love and what love really is. Right. How we get beyond physical attraction to bearing our souls and not hiding between, behind what we look like, but actually allowing ourselves to reveal the interior of who we really are. And I, I just think it's um, learned a lot doing it and changing it a lot in previews. And that was a case in point of not listening to an audience. Hmm. And um, uh, it was very, I guess also personal, you know, I think it, it, it became hard. Fortunately, I was a good enough director by that time to keep the company spirits up and we would laugh about it. And, um, but it, it was tough to win an audience over which we eventually did, and I think Steve did by writing just an extremely simple little song. A friend of mine who I, a guy named Alan Sean, who's an incredible composer and so brilliant, he came to the early previews and he just said to me, well, you know, I love it, but you just don't know why he falls in love with her. Hmm. And that was then I wrote the scene on the train and Steve wrote the song on the train. And this guy was a hero, you know, uh, uh, in, in, as an officer, and um, it really came down to this woman saying, you're in love with this gorgeous woman who is exquisite, but what is she giving up for you? You know, she was m married for starters and wouldn't leave her husband for him and whatever, and you're a soldier and you save lives, and I want you to know that I love you so much that I'd give my life for you. And, uh, a follow up. A follow to that, like you talk about that song in Passion and in, in the book you talk about um, finishing the hat being that kind of moment. Was there a moment in Into the Woods that really crystallized what the sort of... I think No One is, al no one is Alone is a song. Somebody was asking me in another interview, you know, if I had to pick a song of our shows that would be applicable today, not applicable, but it might be something one would want to hear at this point in what we're all going through with the pandemic. I just thought no one is alone is kind of profound. There are people who argue that that's bullshit and we're all alone and you know a lot of people talk about that number but to me it it personified what I wrote the show for which was the idea of what we teach our children and the kind of morality we want to teach them and the difference between right and um, Maria Seferetti wants to know, as the musical, as the music director of a local theater group for actors with disabilities, what are your thoughts on inclusivity and breaking the barriers of contemporary music theater? I think that's a great, great question. And, you know, I'm old-ish or maybe just old, old school. And um, uh, it's, it's terrific that we're starting to make the work we do inclusive and not exclusive. And, um, you know, I'm doing a show now that's gonna, was unfortunately closed down right before it was gonna start previewing, but it was something I wrestled with a lot because I, when I did Into the Woods the first time, I worked with a casting director named uh, Joanna Merlin, who very much wanted uh, us to have an interracial cast and pushed in that direction. And it was so new to us, it wasn't, like that we didn't want to, there was just no precedent for it. And people think we, you know, it, it's been a long time coming. Um, but also, you know, I'm working on a show now that's about, about historical figures and it's not Hamilton. I mean, you can do that with Hamilton because it's across the board, but uh, this is a small, a small show with only 10 people in it and they're related. And um, 
it was hard figuring out. We tried to get diversity in it. It wasn't that we did or didn't use people because of their color. It was just that we didn't find the right chemistry and the right people who could sing and whatever. And um, I just think everybody's thinking about it now. And I think it's important, but I think there's also certainly places where you want to have an all black cast or an all Hispanic cast or um, in terms of people with disabilities, I think um, you ask yourself, is this, you know, is it a new show about people with disabilities? Or is this a show everyone knows that uh, people with disabilities are performing in? And um, I just think we need to embrace all those possibilities. And um, I think you guys are, the younger generation are certainly more open to that. It'll eventually be like Britain. I think the Brits have done a better job of this. Um, I just think it gets problematic when you're writing a new show with new characters and whether uh, you're embracing race as a theme or issue of the show or not. And it's just complicated. You have to be very clear what you're doing in those instances. Well, I'm gonna ask one final it's actually sort of a comment as a final comment oh, yeah, please. from, from, Sh from Shaney Ferguson. And, um, and then uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up and, and, and thank you for your, for your time and sharing this time with us and the good people of Philadelphia. Thank hey, you. Philadelphia, and, and, yeah. and, and truly that, you know, I just want to say before I read this final comment, I'm just, you know, thank you for writing this book. Thank you for writing the show, James. And it's, it truly has changed um, so many people's lives and, and offered a vista of what, you know, an art form can be. And, continues to be so inspiring to so many of us. So thank you and thank you for pulling back the curtain of how it got made. Um, I think it's so broadly applicable, as I said up top, not just to folks who wanna write musicals, but folks who have a creative impulse. You know, you didn't start off saying, I wanna write the next great American musical, but just having that creative instinct and, you know, pursuing it doggedly and, you know, and following that passion and it's really inspiring. So thank you. Well, thanks, thank you. Hey for reading it and all Hey, of hey, I, I, I really loved it. Um, okay, this is from Shaney Ferguson. It says, I saw the show in 1984. And while uh, you may have been young, I was still younger, just 15. It changed my life, impelled me to perform in musical theater for many years and support my children's musical interests later on. So I just want to say thank you. And so on behalf of all of us, Thank you, and um, thank you, Philadelphia, for joining us. And uh, you know, thanks for sharing your time with us, James. And really, thank you really for great. having me. Really, all right. Great talking to you, Bench. Great talking to you always, James. Thanks so much. Take care.